<coughs> yes, What's Stephen. What's the difference between the birthright and the blessing that Jacob would Birthright have? is a human thing. Land. Uh, it is, it is um, you know, what um, uh, the head of the family, legally, from a human point of view. So I have control of, of my legal, my estate. The birthright is the right that a person has to the father's legal estate. So it's a human, the humans, a human side of this. Now, the Kleinic principle is look for the unexpected. And here we come to another unexpected thing. As if we haven't had enough unexpected things. Um, a family that's blessed by God. What do you think, what would you expect a family to look like that's blessed by God? Oh, good. A good family, yeah, a nice family, Brady Bunch family. It, everything's hunky-dory and everybody gets on nicely with everybody else and there is nothing that goes wrong in a family blessed by God. Um, uh, if you think that, just have a look at the story of Jacob's family. Now, if ever there was a dysfunctional family, <laughs> this is it. Let's sell our youngest brother. <laughs> yeah. And um, the trouble starts right at the foundation of it with um, two wives, of which one is the favourite. It's a polygamous situation. Jacob favours Rachel over Leah. Leah, sons to concubines. And concubines them. And so he favoured the one, the sons that were born to the wives to the ones that were born to the de facto's, the concubines. And then of his sons he favours then not the oldest but the yeah. youngest. Probably because he was the youngest. Uh, well, all sorts of reasons. It's because uh, Joseph comes from Rachel. Jacob's Okay. Now, have, what's the problem of uh, what's the cause of disruption in the family? Let's just go, just as a good summary in chapter 37, verses 3 to 4, please, um, Tony. Chapter 37 of Genesis. 3 to 4. 3 to 4 summarizes the situation. That puts it in a nutshell. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. Then he made a richly ornamented bride for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not give a kind of word to okay. him. Okay, hatred of the brother. And Joseph is his own worst enemy. He has tickets on himself and he uh, is quite happy to tell everybody about the wonderful dreams that he has, which shows what a wonderful guy he's going to be. <laughs> Uh, and you know, the result of that is that his brother sees the opportunity. Initially, they want to kill him, but uh, the oldest boy, Simeon, intervenes. Reuben. And, Reuben, rather. Reuben. Reuben intervenes and uh, uh, he's sold as a slave to Egypt. Okay, you'd, you'd expect him then at the end of the story, slave in Egypt. But the strange thing is that even in Egypt, Joseph is a bearer of blessing. Uh, could you read a little bit further in the same chapter? Uh, no, uh, uh, the next couple chapters go to 39. Uh, 2 to 6, please. And then. 2 to 6. Yes. 2 to 6, and then uh, verses uh, 21 to 23. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived the capital of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favour in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of, this house, of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian pigs of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on, the, on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with them except the food he ate. Now that'll do. No, that'll do. That'll do. That'll do. That'll do. And what's the next uh, just pause there. Notice how this fulfills God's promise to Abraham. Through him, through his seed, all families will be blessed. And anybody who acknowledges Abraham and his seed to be blessed will receive blessing. 
So the descendants of Jacob are mediators of God's blessing. Go to the end. And this even ha doesn't just happen in Potiphar's household, but it even happens in the prison. End of the chapter, could you read? 20, 23, is it? Uh, no, here, uh, 21 to 23. Okay. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge for all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. You need to know that for the Israelites, Egypt is the land of death, the land of curse. So Joseph brings God's blessing to a cursed place. Um, it, it, to Potiphar's household and even to the prison. The prison becomes a place where God's blessing is brought by Joseph. Um, strangely, you know the whole story. It's a wonderful story then of how Joseph then who has been sold into slavery, and that should have been the end of the story, ends up saving the family and also the lives of many, many people. Now, there's a wonderful theology at work here, which is summarised in two passages. Uh, Karen, can you read those two passages? First of all, chapter 45, verses 5 to 8. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers, making himself known when they come down to Egypt in order to buy grain for their house, their family. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there, was, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no flowing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for your remnant, is it really a remnant, for okay. earth and to save your lives, I write deliverance. Right, uh, no, this is strange. On the face of it, Jacob's sons did a terrible deed. They got rid of their brother, sold him into slavery. But behind that, God is at work. God sends Joseph down to Egypt in order to save many lives. <coughs> um, in a great way. Including saving the family. Strange way God has of working. Uh, and that's summarised after the death of Jacob. His brothers come, Joseph's brothers come to him because they expect him finally to take revenge in typical oriental fashion. Uh, chapter 50, verses 19 to 20. Well, we better read it from 15 through to 20 to get the whole context. Please, uh, Adele. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When the message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to him, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. Now, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he assured them and spoke kindly to them. The key verse here is verse 20. You intended it quite literally for evil, but God intended it for good. How? To save the lives of many people. God's blessing works in a strange way. In the families that he blesses and people that he blesses. He doesn't prevent evil from happening, but what does God's blessing do? Uses it for something good. He what? Uses it. For he good. uses evil to bring good. He does the impossible thing. 
No human beings can bring good out of evil. Out of evil, from a human point of view, you only get evil. That's the law of human dealings. God does something astonishing. His blessing doesn't stop evil from happening, but it brings good out of evil. He uses it for his own purposes. Now, how did God bring good out of evil? The evil was those that family conflict, going right back to the very beginning, all the problems with Jacob. And then his two wives and the conflicts within between the boys out of that evil and that also then led to in in Egypt remember that uh, Joseph was uh, uh, his master's wife tried to seduce him he refuses to go along with her and the trumped up charge he gets sent into prison terrible evil deeds uh, the worst kind of things and yet God brings good out of this evil not just for Joseph and not just for his family but for Egypt and the surrounding nations now, where do you see this most dramatically? What is the most evil deed that <coughs> humanity has ever done? Hmm? So it's, the crucifixion. it's the crucifixion. And yet, where is the place where God has brought the greatest blessing for every single human being? It's the crucifixion. Um, Joseph is points, the story of Joseph points to the coming of Jesus. In a little scale here, God's working out what he's going to work out on a large scale eventually. Lastly, take notice then in terms of blessing that whereas previously blessing had gone from father to one son, with Jacob blessing goes to all the twelve sons <coughs> of Jacob. So the blessing goes out. Um, but there are special blessings given to Judah, the blessing of kingship, and then there's a special blessing that's given to Ephraim, the younger <coughs> son of Joseph, who gets the best part of the land, the most fertile part of the promised land. So they get special blessings, but every one of the 12 sons is blessed. Now, let me summarize the theology of, the, of, uh, of Genesis. Um, Genesis is the book of blessing. And take notice then how God's blessing um, works by grace and not by law. God transmits his blessing to Abraham and his seed through his word of promise. Now normally, in human affairs, blessing comes through family, land, custom, law. Um, now, you, uh, you, you'd understand that. That's a very strong part of Korean culture. Now, blessing comes through your family, your culture, <coughs> custom, law, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but here, you get a new kind of blessing that doesn't come through law, but comes through promise, grace. And look at the way it works. It's given apart from family and ancestors, it's not through the spirits of the ancestors who bring blessing to Abraham and his descendants. The blessing comes apart from Abraham's possession of the land or any land. He leaves all land. The only land he owns is a cemetery. So it's apart from land. Thirdly, blessing comes apart from natural fertility and procreation. Very, very important. Because that's normally the way we see things in human affairs through procreation, through having children, blessing goes. Notice all the infertile people here in this story. Uh, next, blessing comes apart from the law of primogeniture. Primogeniture is firstborn son. Now normally blessing goes in human affairs from father to, not to daughters, but to sons. And which son? The oldest son, first one. That's a very strong part of Korean culture, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's part of all traditional cultures. Right? That's the natural way, but notice here that God bypasses this to give his blessing. Um, and blessing comes apart from human plans and desires, despite what all the things that Sarah does and Hagar does and uh, uh, Jacob does to try and manipulate God's blessing. God's blessing still continues apart from human 
attempts to grab hold of it and manipulate it to advantage. Most significantly, blessing goes despite human sin. Look what happens in Jacob's own family. The sin that's committed there, God's blessing still works despite human sin. Or even blessing, God's blessing works through human sin. Now that is so countercultural, it's so uh, <coughs> astonishing that it, it's almost impossible to believe and to hold on to. Uh, blessing works through sin, despite sin. Uh, it's a matter of grace. Any questions on that? The theme of blessing. Please make an effort to get your head around it. The whole book of Genesis has to do with blessing. That's its main theme. Um, the blessing of all humanity in uh, creation. The blessing of all human beings after the fall. But then there's the blessing of Abraham and God's covenant to bless Abraham and through Abraham to bless the whole human race. Okay, now what are the main themes of Genesis? Here's my attempt to pin them down. First of all, the theme of creation. God creates the world, but doesn't stop there. He creates all the nations of the world, and he creates Israel. So what part of Genesis deals with creation? Brendan? Dylan. Dylan, Dylan sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So close. Dylan? What part of... What, what what part of Genesis deals with creation? The first part. <laughs> Wrong. What do you mean by? Yeah. It's the whole of Genesis deals with creation. You mean creation of the covenant or blessing? That's right. God create, doesn't just create the universe and humanity, but he creates then after the fall nations. <clears throat> and then after that he creates Israel. Trick questions, watch out. Um, whether you were listening or not, you see, that was my... Uh, and whether you understood what I said. No, okay. I yes. No, not trick questions. I don't want to find out, uh, catch you out. But notice that the whole book has to do with creation. And uh, the second big theme is the importance of God's word. The power of God's word, his creative commands and his... Uh, the creative, gracious promises, both in creation and in Israel, Israel's his history. God's word doesn't just create the world, it sustains the world. It guides people after the fall. It creates Israel. It sustains Israel. So God's word is at work in creation, history, and in Israel's history. Thirdly, now please note this very importantly, there's two covenants that God makes in Genesis, the first with Noah and the second with Abraham. Fourth theme, um, Genesis shows how God's blessing operates in a fallen world through procreation, despite human sin, and through Abraham's descendants. So God's blessing works even for Adam and Eve, even though they've sinned. It works through uh, Cain, even though Cain is a murderer. And uh, so Cain has children. Abra Adam and Eve have children. The blessing still works. But that blessing works in a special way then through Abraham and his descendants. Uh, the next one is a minor theme for us, but very important for the Jewish people. Uh, Genesis shows the origin of the most important sanctuaries in the Promised Land um, at the places where God appeared to the patriarchs. If you want to know which are the holy places in Israel, once the people enter the land, read the book of Genesis and you'll find the founding stories of those sanctuaries, those holy places, the places where people have altars where they meet with God. Now, um, take notice, many of these places didn't have a temple. A temple is a building around a holy place. What they have is, it's a sacred place that's demarcated and it's focused around an altar. Most of these just had, you know, were open air sites with an altar. Uh, in fact, probably archaeologists have excavated um, 
the altar or later altar at Shechem, the site of that. Lastly, and that's the theme we've just touched on that, Genesis shows God's hidden providence, God's hidden way of doing good uh, by bringing good out of evil in human affairs. It's hard to read the book of Genesis and to moralise from it because the book of Genesis is a, is a story not just of God's creation but of also of human sin. And what's most astonishing, there's no attempt to present Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as moral examples, as paragons of moral virtue. God brings good out of evil, works despite human sin, even the sins of his own chosen people. Well, what's the purpose of the book of Genesis? Notice that Genesis means beginning origin. Genesis is a book of beginnings that shows four things. How the world and Israel was created by God's word and upheld by it. And there's two words there, are the performative commands. It says to Abraham, go, be a blessing, walk before me, those commands. But then there's also the promises. <coughs> Secondly, it shows how God's blessing works constructively, creatively, even in a fallen world. It shows Israel's place among the nations, uh, place in the world and in connection with more distant nations and the closer nations. It helps the Israelites to identify who they are and how they fit into the scheme of things. Lastly, and very practically for the ongoing story, it shows how the Israelites came to live in the land of Egypt. Don't remember at the very end you have Jacob's family moving from the land of Canaan which had been devastated by drought into Egypt, which was much more secure because of the Nile um, uh, and the water from the Nile. Okay, time. We've got time for a few questions if you want some. You got your heads around all that? Right, just one preliminary thing to pick up before uh, we take a break and go to chapel and as an introduction to what follows. Um, big picture stuff. The Pentateuch is divided into five books. Right? Those five books are not completely separate from each other, but they tell an ongoing story. There's a narrative framework that holds this together. And the narrative framework is basically a story of a journey from here onwards. Um, how does it work? It's the story of how the Israelites came from Egypt to the Promised Land. Uh, so, and what follows? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the book that you're looking at. What holds that together is a narrative, a story. And that story is the story of a journey. And that journey is a journey in a number of stages, and uh, at each... It, goes to a number of different places in which God gives his people uh, things for their life. So Genesis ends with the Israelites where? In Egypt. in Egypt. Exodus begins with the story of how the Israelites left Egypt and came to which place? Sinai. Sinai. Okay, that's the first journey. And then there's a huge amount of material as uh, of, uh, which is located at Mount Sinai. So from Genesis chapter 20 through to Numbers 10, which includes the whole of Leviticus, you have material which God gave, laws, promises, things that God gave to his people at Mount Sinai. That's the first location. Then you get the second journey um, from Sinai, down the Sinai Peninsula, to a place called Kadesh. Kadesh Barnea, which is down in the Negev. Let me get my map. I'll put it away. How about that? No, I don't have it. If you can imagine, 
Egypt being here, Sinai Peninsula there, Dead Sea there, Mediterranean across here, uh, Jerusalem's here, it's down here. It's a place uh, where uh, in the desert, well desert is not, it's not absolute desert, it's a bit like the country down in the Mali, so low rainfall, but it's a place where there are 12 permanent springs, permanent water supply, an oasis, and it's a big oasis complex. So there's a journey from Sinai to Kadesh, and there's some stuff that's given there, and then there's a journey from Kadesh to the plains of Moab, which is the site then for uh, the book of Deuteronomy. That's the location of the book of Deuteronomy. So notice then, so you get journeys, and in each place, uh, you have God revealing himself to his people and speaking his word to his people. What are the locations? They're speaking at Sinai, they're speaking at Sinai, they're speaking on the plains of Moab. Yes? Just wondering, on that little map there that you threw, uh, where's uh, the Jordan River? Let me get the proper That's map. The Further north. Yeah. yeah. Here we are. Okay. Here's Egypt. Sinai Peninsula. Mount Sinai is down here, probably. Now, notice all these locations are hypothetical. We can't be sure of them. Kadesh is up here, where that black dot is. Now, the strange part of the journey is that the uh, they, people wanted to go straight north up this way uh, but they were blocked and so they had to go a roundabout way into uh, Edom and Moab and to come across from what's the present day Jordan. So do you see that there? This is Sinai, this is Kadesh, plains of Moab across the Jordan from Jerusalem. So a you have a journey and three significant locations uh, in that journey. Or four if you start off from Egypt. So Egypt to Sinai, Sinai to Kadesh, Kadesh to Plains of Moab. Now what's most significant is that the Pentateuch finishes before the journey reaches its goal. What's its goal? The promised land. Or it looks as if it's the promised land. That's what it looks like, but in fact, the journey doesn't end with the Promised Land because the Israelites never take possession of the whole of it, ever in their history, even to the present day. So Now, uh, when we come to Exodus, you need to see that that tells a certain part of this big picture, this story. Okay. Chapel.